the fullerenes uh, were discovered um, during experiments to reproduce the uh, chemistry in a carbon star. And they were an accidental serendipitous discovery. Um, it turns out that carbon, first of all, assembles into linear chains, and then those linear chains uh, assemble into a cage. And the cages are called fullerenes, and they are hollow. Um, the most famous one is C60, which has 60 carbon atoms, called Buckminster Fullerene. And it was named by me after Buckminster Fuller because the, um, that was a clue to what the structure might be. Well, in the early um, 1970s, um, the University of Sussex, we created some lung carbon chain molecules. That was with my colleague David Walton, who was an expert at string carbon atoms in long uh, bead-like chains. And uh, we studied their microwave spectra and radio spectra. And uh, this was carried out with an undergraduate, Anthony Alexander, really outstanding student. Um, and then at the, about the same time, uh, chemistry of interstellar space became very interesting as radio astronomy developed. And uh, I decided to look for this molecule in, by radio astronomy. And this was carried out with Takeshi Oka and astronomers at the National Research Council in Canada. And we were very surprised to discover that these chains were um, more abundant than we actually expected. And then we synthesized another one, one with seven carbon atoms, and that was even more uh, abundant than expected. And then we discovered one with nine. That was around the mid-70s mid to early 80s. And then a, a very big discovery was made of a carbon star, a particular one that was quite close, a red giant, IRC plus 10216. And this was a very um, intense infrared source. And radio astronomers then discovered that these carbon chains were coming out of this star in very large amounts. That was about the early 80s. And um, I, about 1984 at Easter, I'd been invited to Rice University by Bob Curl, a friend of mine. And he said I should go and see uh, Rick Smalley, who developed some very interesting technology using a laser to vaporize metals. And uh, so I went over to the lab, and whilst he was uh, demonstrating what he'd been doing, I thought, well, in instead of um, vaporizing a metal, why not vaporize graphite and create the same conditions in th that uh, one has in a carbon star, a red giant star? A year and a half later, we did that experiment, and when we vaporized the carbon, um, we discovered something quite extraordinary. And that was uh, not only did we make these carbon chains as I had expected, it was a very simple experiment and not even a very important experiment beforehand, but it became very important because it made this discovery that as well as these carbon chains, the carbon chains r went on to assemble cage-like molecules. And the specific one that stuck out was a very intense signal of one with 60 carbon atoms, which had the same uh, structure as a football with 12 pentagons and uh, 20 hexagons, and it's C60. And whilst we were trying to understand what was going on, and in fact this was carried out with some fantastic young students, Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien, Yuan Liu, um, one thought that came into my mind was that maybe the um, architectural structures of Buck Buckminster Fuller, who had created geodesic domes, in particular one at Expo in 1967, which I had a very striking image of, um, but at the dead of night and bright lights from the inside might have a clue. And it was that clue that led us to understanding that this structure might be that of a football, and it has the same structure as the geodesic domes of Buckminster Fuller. And because that was a clue to what it might be, I called the C60 molecule Buckminster Fullerene after Buckminster Fuller. And um, then uh, in discussions, we shortened it so the whole family of these cage molecules would be called fullerenes. That was in 1985. Uh, five years later, after a lot of hard work in the laboratory trying to pin down whether that structure was correct, uh, it was extracted uh, by a, a, an American German group of Kretschmer and Huffman, 
and at the same time by our group at the University of Sussex with uh, Jonathan Hare and myself and Roger Taylor and Abdul Sadar um, and uh, it turns out with David Walton as well that uh, we were able to prove that the uh, structure of this molecule was the same as the modern football with 12 pentagons, 12 times 5 is 60 and 20 hexagons. And that breakthrough led to a whole new area of chemistry, the chemistry of the fullerenes. And then in looking in more detail on how the fullerenes were created, um, the nanotubes were rediscovered again by Osawa. They'd been previously discovered by Endo in Japan around the 1970s. Um, but they were rediscovered again. And then that led to a, a rejuvenation of um, uh, carbon materials studies, nanotechnology. And then, of course, later, um, a few years later, to the breakthrough in graphene. So somehow this uh, original, very simple, not very important experiment really uh, catalyzed the creation of the modern field of carbon nanotechnology. I'm often asked um, about the future and the applications of fullerenes. And that's technology. I, it's not something that uh, has ever bothered me in my research because I just do fundamental science and are interested in the way it is, and that's how the fullerenes were discovered. Um, I, to term, some extent, leave that to people who do research and development. Um, I think, however, if um, my view is the most important aspect of C60 and the fullerenes such as the others like C70 is that they're powerful electron capture molecules. And therefore, I think in the future, the most important aspect will be the storage of electrons. And this is important in things like battery technology and also solar energy conversion. So that's where I think it will, the major applications will be in molecular electronics. There are some thoughts that it might be useful in medicinal chemistry and other things like this, but this is still quite a way off. Um, I, I think it's possible that putting an atom on the inside of C60 is very important because it's physically trapped rather than chemically trapped. And if you look at um, the applications of say radioactive um, elements and atoms in radiotherapy and cancer. The one problem with these compounds is that they are chemically toxic. And so C60 should be able to avoid that by putting um, a radioactive atom on the inside of, of this cage. So it's trapped there, not chemically, which can then break that chemical bond, but it can't get out. And if you tag the outside so it can um, sort of identify the area which is cancerous or where there is a problem, then you can uh, tag that and the atom can get very close to the, the dangerous area. Those are some of the uh, applications, it seems to me, that are most important. I think there are, there are two important aspects of the discovery of the fullerenes. The first is that it was a serendipitous discovery um, during some very... Uh, simple experiments which didn't look important and I think it's a pointer and a message to people who um, try to organize a research to try to do something important that you cannot tell whether something is important until you've done the experiment so it's about fundamental science and the importance of that of fundamental science to the future and I think we can tell that to people journalists and media people and politicians and even to science, some scientists, uh, until you're blue in the face, they do not get the message that we must continue to support young people who have bright ideas, but which don't appear to be important for strategy and technology in the future. That's the first and general importance of this discovery. The second one is that um, we've been working on carbon for years and years. I mean, people have had, there, there are whole laboratories studying soot and fuel and things of this nature. And it shows how incapable strategic and, technology, and technological science is. Um, research which is focused on using fuel and looking at carbon particles can be in making discoveries. Because it turns out 
that this, this molecule, this breakthrough, was discovered, a major breakthrough in carbon materials, not by carbon research laboratories, not by fuel, but by looking at what was going on in a carbon star. Fundamental science. Uh, the sort of science that is not being funded at the present time. And it really indicates how limited uh, applied research is because they should have discovered this when they're looking at how fuel burns and what sort of material is produced after, say, methane or petrol is burnt in a car. It turns out that in Japan, there's a $20 million company making fullerenes by the sackful by burning methane. How much of a sort of black nose that is on the face of people in the soot community, that they miss this big discovery. And that's the other aspect of this. As far as we're concerned, perhaps there's one third that a whole new area of fullerene chemistry has been created, which nobody expected. And uh, it's not the thing that can be easily predicted. Although there were one or two um, papers in the 1970, 1971, um, um, and about 1980, uh, maybe 1972, a Russian paper in 1972, a Japanese paper a couple of years earlier, where this molecule was discussed in the literature. But nobody really thought that this molecule could be so easily made as just by burning methane. So it's a black mark on the huge number of applied strategic research labs who are carrying out work on soot production, on combustion of carbon feedstocks.